Greetings in the precious name of Jesus. In today's segment of the Revelation series, we are going to talk about the Smyrna Church in Revelation 2. And uh, in my book, I call them the Brilliant Church of Smyrna. And in our foregone segment, we discussed about the church in Ephesus. And uh, today we are going to talk about the church in Smyrna. This is the second church of the seven churches in the book of Revelation chapters 2 and 3. And today I'm going to read to you uh, from chapter 2 verse 8 onwards to verse 11. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works, and tribulation, and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Now my dear friends, I told you to make yourself a chart in which to have seven rows, naming each, each of the seven churches, and then about eight columns to talk about the giver, the, the condemnation, the commendation, the counsel, and the reward, and the historical dates. Now, if you had uh, studied the foregone segment where I talked about uh, the Ephesian church, you may have noticed that I did not mention the historical dates there. Why? May Perhaps because it's not very important, but for us to uh, make a note of it, to study, you can say from AD 30 to AD 100, because it is from AD 100 onwards. In other words, after the writing of the book of Revelation, that the historical dates uh, come into very important uh, play, because the historical dates from AD 100 happens right after the book of Revelation. So to say from AD 30 to AD 100 is not necessarily prophetical for John because John writes in AD 100. But anything that's going to happen after that for John would be prophetical. Now we are in 2015 and uh, for us anything that happened before 2015 is in history. But for John who wrote in AD 100, things that happened, anything after AD 100 would be in the future. So the historical dates that I'm going to concentrate on after the Church of Smyrna or from the Church of Smyrna would be playing a very significant role in our study. Okay, now that I have read, now let me read a little bit from my book about Smyrna so that you know about the city of Smyrna. The meaning of the name Smyrna is aroma of myrrh. Sh myrrh -na. Myrrh was a very important fragrance. It was an essence which people from all over the world came to purchase. Okay, and uh, therefore it was uh, a fairly okay, not not very rich, but uh, if you uh, if you like, it's like in the upper middle class uh, position when it comes to economics. And uh, I'll, I'll read from what I have written in my book. The meaning of the name Smyrna is the aroma of myrrh. The fragranced oil was commonly used to daub corpses. Although it was used to daub corpses, it was also used in many religions as incense because Myrrh was a major essence in producing many other incense items in many of the world. Okay? The city of Smyrna 
was located on the coast of Lonia uh, or, or as the head of the Gulf, having a well sheltered harbour beautified by Alexander the Great and Antigonus and designated the beautiful. We are talking about a beautiful city and uh, it was uh, beautified by Alexander the Great in 333 uh, BC when he went on conquering uh, the world. And this superb natural harbour made the city an important commercial centre. In spite of keen competition from the neighbouring cities of Ephesus and Pergamum, Smyrna called itself the first city of Asia. Why? Because many people landed in Smyrna even if they had to go to Ephesus or to Pergamum. So it was a port city but not as rich as Corinth which had two very important uh, harbours. Uh, Smyrna had one little harbour but a natural harbour. And therefore, uh, Samana did have many people visit. And I did uh, many uh, 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 reasonable research into uh, a lot of other nations. And I found out that uh, even from India and Sri Lanka, uh, those kings who lived in the first century AD went to Samana or they sent uh, traders to Samana to buy uh, myrrh. So myrrh from Samana was exported to many, uh, many parts of the world uh, those days, including countries like Sri Lanka and uh, India. Now, Smyrna had a large commerce and a population of 200,000 at the time John wrote. It was celebrated for its school of schools of science and medicine. Wow! And for its handsome buildings, a beautiful place with some sort of money because of their myrrh. Among them was the uh, Homerium for Smyrna was one of several places which claimed to be the birthplace of the poet Homer. You remember Homer, right? So Smyrna is believed to be uh, the birthplace of Homer. On the slope of Mount Pegasus was a theatre that seated 20,000 spectators. So they were in for fun, right? They were uh, fun-loving people at, as well. Now, now look at this. In AD 23, a temple was built in honor of Tiberius and his mother Julia. And the golden street uh, connecting the temples of uh, Zeus and uh, Cybele is said to have been the best in any ancient city. As early as 195 BC, before Christ, Smyrna foresaw the rising power of Rome and built a temple for pagan Roman worship. Okay. In 23 BC, it was given the honor of building a temple of the Emperor Tiberius because of its years of faithfulness to Rome. Thus, the city became a center for the cult of emperor worship. Okay, they were worshipping the emperor of Rome and uh, I will explain uh, the, the significance of that in relation to the persecution that they went through. Okay. Uh, thus, the city became a center for the cult of emperor worship, a fanatical religion that later, under such emperors as Nero and Domitian, brought on severe persecution to the early church. And we know that the apostle Paul was uh, beheaded during the time of Nero. Although it's not mentioned in the Bible, we have sufficient historical record to prove that it happened. Now, if you are a follower of church history, you would uh, come across a very famous name called Polycarp. Okay, Polycarp was the angel of the church in Smyrna. He was the bishop at that time. So, as I said in uh, uh, our first chapter of Revelation, that the angel of the church actually represents the shepherd. Now, the angel of uh, Smyrna, who is receiving uh, this epistle through John, is actually Polycarp. Okay, Polycarp, the great church father. Now, he was martyred without the sanction of the Roman government in AD 168, 86 years after his conversion. Okay, the Jews of Smyrna were more antagonistic than were the Romans to the spread of Christianity. Now, that's something that we need to take on board because the Jews, they are lived Jews. Hey, you know what? I'm going to tell you that even today, some Jews live in that place. Okay, in Smyrna. Now, uh, they were much more uh, aggressive towards the Christians. They were anti-Christian much more than the Romans. Of course, the Romans were. 
But the Romans were anti-Christian uh, because uh, of uh, the emperor worship, which I'll explain in a minute. Uh, but then the Jews were the ones who were more uh, anti-Christian. Okay, uh, for it is said that even on Saturday, their sacred day, they brought wood for the fire in which Polycarp was burned. His grave is still shown in a cemetery there. Amazing, isn't it? Now the Jews usually don't work on Saturdays, but in order to burn Polycarp, that, was, that happened on a Saturday, and the Jews went and uh, gathered firewood uh, to burn this guy. Ooh, that was how bad the Jews were at that time against the Christians. The Lord's allusions to persecutions accord with this identification. Now I have mentioned that in my book uh, at a, in, a, in greater detail in the forthcoming pages, but then uh, I will explain uh, certain things uh, to you. Okay. Now the attributes uh, of him which was dead and is alive would comfort Smyrna under persecution. I will talk about that in a minute. Now no, no, look at this. The idol Dionysus Okay, Dionysus at Samana was believed to have been killed and come to life. A false claim of that deity. Okay, in contrast to his lying fable is Christ's title, the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Because we know, both historically and by faith, that Christ died and rose again from the dead and his empty grave is there in Israel today. Wow. Like many other cities of Asia Minor, Smyrna suffered frequently, especially during the years 178 to 180 AD from earthquakes, but always escaping entire destruction. Okay? During the Middle Ages, the city was the scene of many struggles, the fiercest of which was directed by Timur against Christians. Or some people would pronounce Timur as Timur. Okay? According to tradition, he built a tower using as stones the heads of a thousand captives which he put to death. Yet Smyrna was the last, now listen to this very carefully. Smyrna was the last of the Christian cities to hold out against the Mohammedan, Mohammedans or the Muslims and finally in 1424 fell into the hands of the Turks. The unusually large portion of Christians in the city renders it unclean to the eyes of strict Muslims and they call it Giyahu Izmir, meaning the infidel Smyrna, even today. Okay? We know Turkey is a Muslim country, Istanbul is the capital of Turkey, and Smyrna is in the outskirts of Istanbul. There are in it about 20,000 Greeks, 8,000 Armenians, 1,000 Europeans, and 9,000 Jews even today. Today, Smyrna is known as Izmir the chief city of Anatolia and one of, one of the strongest cities in modern Turkey. Excavations in the central part of Izmir have uncovered a Roman marketplace from the 2nd century AD. A fairly well-preserved Roman aqueduct may be seen near the modern city. Ancient Smyrna, as I told earlier on, that the seven churches that we are talking about in Revelation are not occupied by people, inhabitants, but the ruins are there. So modern Izmir, which is the, the, uh, the Muslim variant of Smyrna, is actually a few miles away from the ancient uh, uh, Smyrna, a few miles away, had its beginnings in the first half of the third millennium BC and may have been the residence of Homer, the poet. Excavations under, they are under the direction of Ekrem Akurgal have proved to be fruitful. Okay, my dear friends, now let me, um, now that I have uh, shown you a little bit about Smyrna, there is one thing that I want to really mention to you. Although the people of Smyrna were a little bit educated, as we saw that there were schools of science and medicine, usually foreigners came and studied. Foreigners in the sense, people who lived in other parts of uh, Asia, many Ephesians. Because Ephesus was not too far from Smyrna and Ephes Ephesus uh, was a city of educated people. As I said uh, in our foregone segment, the doctors, lawyers and engineers uh, would uh, inhabit Ephesus largely. Many of them came and studied in Smyrna. Nonetheless, the household enterprise 
the household business of the people in Smyrna was production of myrrh. Everybody, almost everybody, um, except for the foreigners, except for the foreigners who came to reside temporarily in uh, homes or boarding houses to study in those uh, schools of medicine and uh, science, the original people of Smyrna lived on their own property. They were rich enough to own their own property. Now in their own property, they were able to use a particular stone and a particular tree together, together uh, producing the incense called myrrh. So the people of Smyrna had a household business. Every home literally had a business of selling myrrh. And they didn't advertise myrrh. People came to buy. And usually people would go door to door asking for the, the price of myrrh. And uh, they would come to every home comparing prices of myrrh from this house, this one, that one. And they would buy from whoever would negotiate a decent bargain. Now, it was to those people that Christianity came. Right. Now, what does Jesus say? How is Jesus introduced? Column number one. These thing, things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Jesus is abstractly mentioning his own persecution there. And the, the contrast between the two phrases is immense. He is saying, I am the first and the last, okay, which is his divinity. The divinity of Jesus is shown there. Because he is the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. Which one is the Alpha and Omega? Look, now we have Jesus the God and Jesus the man. Although he is one person, we are talking about Jesus the God and Jesus the man. Now which of these was the first and the last? The God, right? Jesus, the divine, the divine Christ, the, the divine Jesus, God, is the first and the last. Now look at the contrast. Which was dead and is alive. Who died? The divine Jesus? No. Man Jesus. God Jesus became man. And he died and he rose again from the dead and he is alive. And today we have the man Jesus alive. So the contrast is between the divine Jesus and the human Jesus. And he is saying, look, I am the first and the last. I am God. But even I died. And I rose again from the dead when I became a man. This is what it suggests, my friends. The church in Smyrna was a persecuted church. And I am going to explain to you how they were persecuted and what they did in, uh, through that persecution to remain as Christians. They were a persecuted people. And Jesus wanted to encourage them. Jesus wanted to tell them, Hey, not only you, I also was persecuted. To the extent where I died and I rose again from the dead. And I am God. I am the first and the last. If that can happen to me, it can happen to you. So don't think that you are going through persecution because of me. And that's a big thing. Even I have gone through persecution because of you. Look at that. The people in Smyrna are told by Jesus, you are pers being persecuted for me. But I was persecuted for you. I died for you. I shed my blood for you. So I died and rose again from the dead. I don't need to die. I cannot die because I'm God. I'm the first and the last. Nonetheless, for you, I left my divinity, thereby the dignity, and descended onto the earth to be killed. I died. That was the extent of my persecution. I was not merely beaten and let go. I did not just go through 
peripheral persecution. But my persecution cost my life. But I was resurrected. I came back to life. So if you are going through persecution, don't think that I don't know what you're going through. I know what you're going through. You see, over against the, the feel of Jesus to the message in the church in Ephesus, the feel of Jesus here was a very kind one, an encouraging one, a very uh, understanding one. He was saying, hey, you, I'm the first and the last. I'm the divine Jesus. But I died. I was persecuted. And I rose again from the dead. Okay? And then, upon producing that credentials, he's able to say what he says in verse 9. He says, I know thy work. Wow. I know thy works. Look, I told you, when I talked about the church in Ephesus, there, when he said, I know thy works, he meant the programs, the, 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 the things that they performed, their performances, etc., etc. But works here do, doesn't mean uh, works as in programs and endeavors and enterprises and uh, arduous uh, working. But it talks about persecution. I know thy works. I know how you suffer. Okay, And that can be now added into the next column called commendation. Okay, commendation. Let's see how Jesus commends them. I know thy works and tribulation. I know your tribulation because I've been through it all. Wow. And we must understand, my dear friends, you and I, no matter what sort of persecution we go through, what sort of troubles we go through, what sort of difficulties uh, we may have, physically, emotionally, mentally, financially, uh, in every way, Jesus understands. I don't know how, but he understands, right? Because he, is, um, he, perse he was persecuted, he died and he rose again from the dead. Wow. And he says, your poverty, I understand your poverty, but thou art rich. What does that mean? Well, I have read a lot of commentaries on this and uh, almost every commentator says that this talks about the spiritual richness they have. Although you are poor in the human realm, you are rich in spirit. While that is true, I'm not dismissing that idea altogether. Yes, even us, even if we lack anything on earth, we don't lack anything spiritually, do we? Because we have the Holy Spirit in us, we have the salvation, we have Jesus with us, and we have a hope for the future. We are, we are rich spiritually over against all the other religions and philosophies of the world. Even atheists, atheists, agnostics, polytheists, pantheists and everybody. We have a hope. We are a hopeful people, right? So we are rich spiritually. But that's not really what Jesus is talking about. I'll explain. He's saying to the people in Smyrna, look, you are poor because you chose to not continue in selling myrrh, which has brought you very low in finances. Now you are struggling, you have poverty, but you are rich. Why? Because if you want, you can start selling the stuff which is produced within your home. My dear friends, myrrh was usually used as an incense to the worship of gods. Okay? Listen to this very carefully. When one becomes a Christian, it is not that the person shouldn't worship other gods, but the person should not contribute to others who worship other gods. I should not worship other gods. And I should not in any way help people worship other gods. Now I am a Hindu. I, I was a Hindu by the way. And uh, today I am a Christian. Now I have Hindu relatives and Hindu friends. Yes, I no longer worship the Hindu gods. But if I help 
my relatives and friends to worship their Hindu gods. Now they, they can worship because they are not saved, they will worship. But if I contribute anything for them to worship the gods, then that is not good. Do you understand? For example, we have something similar to myrrh in our country. Some incense sticks. Now those incense sticks are used to worship, to, to, to light in front of these idols and pictures. Some people who produce these incense sticks become Christians. And I tell them, you no longer can continue in this business. Why? Because people buy these to worship gods. Now you cannot sell these thereby receiving an income and you cannot just say, well, I'm not worshipping other gods. I'm not encouraging them to worship their gods because if they don't buy it from me, they are going to buy it from someone anyway. And you cannot continue in that business. You cannot. On the same token, if you are uh, having a business of selling alcohol, drugs, um, cigarettes, etc., it's not ethical for Christians to use those things, right? We are not here to discuss whether we could drink alcohol or whether smoke or not. I mean, we, I stand on the premise that these things are not good for Christians. And if that is not good for Christians, we shouldn't encourage that to others. We shouldn't be selling those. I, shouldn't, I couldn't have a shop in which I can sell alcohol, cigarettes and other stuff. Uh, and I cannot say, well, you know what? Even if they, they don't buy it from me, they are going to buy it from somebody else. So I might as well uh, sell because it's a business. No, you can't do that. That's called compromise. If I don't do something because it's displeasing to God, I shouldn't assist or help in any way those who do that. Right? And praise God that the people of Smyrna believed that, perhaps through the teachings of Polycarp, I don't know. But uh, they stopped producing myrrh. The Christians stopped producing myrrh. The Christians stopped selling myrrh, thereby becoming poor. Now imagine a father who has his wife and say three children who are suffering without food in Smyrna. Well, he, he in front of his eyes, his family is having no food. He's poor. But if he decides, okay, enough is enough. I'm going to get some of those stones and get some uh, stuff from the bark of the tree and then, you know, mix it and produce the myrrh and start selling. In one day, he could earn the bucks to bring food to his family. That's why Jesus is saying, you are rich, but you chose to be poor for me. My dear friends, I tell my students who come to study uh, to become uh, men and women of God, I tell them, we must serve the Lord, not because we cannot do anything else, not because serving the Lord is the last option we have. We have to serve the Lord by choice, right? I am able, you must be able to say, I am able to do a job. I am able, able to go abroad and I am able to find myself a good uh, career. But I chose not to pursue that, but to serve the Lord. That is, that is the blessing. My dear friends, let me tell you certain things. You see, I don't have a very fancy car. I don't, don't have a very expensive vehicle. And uh, that's, a, that's sometimes very uh, troublesome. During the foregone weekend, I had a meeting in which I had to address in uh, the northwestern part of Sri Lanka in a place called Mana. And uh, not the Mana that the Israelites ate. This is M-A-N-N-A-R, Mana, a beautiful coastal city which was under the war zone in the past. And for the first time, I was invited to speak at a, 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 a 
combined gathering of five districts. Many people came, hundreds of people came and I was supposed to be speaking there. And I didn't have a decent vehicle to go. So we rented a vehicle and with me came Pastor Tushara, Pastor Danny and Brother Rumesh who is standing behind the camera. And uh, the four of us rented a car and then we went. And at one point on our way back, the car, because of a technical problem, not because of uh, anything, but because of a technical problem, it uh, went and uh, banged on a gate of a house. And now the car is uh, in the garage and we have to repair the car. And it, it's a huge uh, problem. And uh, I, I see a lot of other pastors having wonderful vehicles. And at one point when this happened, I was very discouraged. I was like, I, I could drive a better car. I could drive a car. I don't have a car to talk about a better car. I could be driving my own car. If I had my own car, I wouldn't have this problem. And uh, I was a little bit perturbed. But when I came back and when I looked at the faces of my students, I, I, I changed my mind yet again. Why? Because, look, I am able to drive a very expensive car. I am able to live not only in Sri Lanka but in any other country as a rich individual because of the qualifications I have, because of the possibility of me working as a professor in universities or a lecturer at colleges. I have the capacity to be a rich man driving a posh vehicle around. But I'm not doing that because all the money that I'm receiving, I'm spending on lives of students who cannot go to a Bible college to pay. And I'm getting all these children to come here and study. When I say children, they're all 16 and above. And, and they're studying here and I'm feeding them, I'm clothing them and giving them tuition, everything free for four years. And uh, I'm involved in producing men and women of God uh, for the ministry of the kingdom and I was very encouraged and time and again I remind myself of what Jesus says to the people in Smyrna what did what did he say you are I know your poverty yet you are rich you are rich boy you you can you, you don't need to be poor because you have the money making elements within your premises all you have to do is to dig that stone get the back of the uh, a tree, mix it and then make it a powder and sell. You don't need to advertise, you don't need to carry it and uh, go and sell door to door. People come to you, people come to you and buy. So you can be rich but you chose not to be rich because what you sell is not something that the Lord is pleased with. You are selling something that is going to be used to the worship of other gods. Because of that you chose to be poor. Wow! My dear friends, in my life and in the lives of my students and in many of the great men and women of God, their lives, they serve the Lord and they have allowed poverty to come in. Not because they need to be poor, but because they chose to be faithful to God. My dear friends, if you have decided to stand for God, thereby losing some of the financial and other gains had soft to you. Jesus is saying to you, I know your poverty. I know your belittlement. Yet you are rich and you are great. You have forsaken that for me. What more can we do than what the Lord has done for us, my dear friends? Jesus gave up his divinity, at least for a time being, to come and to be born on this earth and to live here and to die for us and to give us salvation. What more could we do? And therefore I encourage you, if you are involved with anything that is displeasing to God, perhaps if you have a business that uh, sells alcohol or intoxicants or cigarettes or anything, incense or anything that is displeasing unto God, and I encourage you to stop it. And if that means that you will have to be poor, go ahead and be poor because the Lord says, I know your poverty and yet you are rich. You are able to uh, do that. And last Saturday, 
when I uh, came back from Mena, I was driving the car now that uh, uh, damaged car. I was driving it halfway. And uh, while I was driving, I was uh, reminding myself of this. Yeah, I could be driving my own vehicle, but uh, it doesn't matter. I'm spending all that money to produce these men and women uh, to be servants of God. And uh, it's okay. I don't have my car. So some, some people, some people, uh, uh, it's kind of weird when some people come and tell me, okay, Pastor Suresh, what is the vehicle you have? Look at my vehicle. And, uh, you know, they are proud and they are happy. Praise God for that. God has blessed those people with nice, wonderful vehicles. But uh, in my case, it's a different ball game altogether because I have lives to feed. I have, I have lives to produce. I have lives uh, for which I have to invest. And I am really happy about that. But then, you know, from time to time, when uh, things happen, to hurt you, you get hurt, and then you begin to think, why, why do I have to suffer? Maybe the people in Samana from time to time thought, uh, why do we have to suffer? Imagine the father that I told you about, who has this wife and three children to feed, and when he sees his wife and the ch three children suffer without food, maybe he would uh, think, okay, I'll uh, start my business again. Uh, but then he would decide, no, no, it doesn't matter even my feet, my family suffers. I'm not going to compromise. I'm not going to produce myrrh and sell. Okay, now that's what Jesus is saying. And that invited persecution, my dear friends, from neighbors, from relatives, and from the Roman government also. Remember, I told you that the Jews also persecuted uh, the Christians. But uh, imagine the neighbors and the family, you know, when you stop uh, doing a business, and uh, then uh, they, 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 they would mock you. They would mock you. They would uh, ridicule you. They would say, oh, yeah, so you have become Christians, huh? So you no longer are involved in your business, huh? Uh, so that uh, the, the, the sarcastic remarks and uh, comments and, uh, of course, persecution from the family. But also, remember, I told you that Tiberius had introduced emperor worship, okay? And therefore, emperor worship was abounding in Samana also. Every junction, at every junction, there was a statue of the head of the of the uh, head head part of the uh, emperor. And people who walk past the, the statue would have to stop and bow and venerate this and go. And the Christians didn't do that, and that aroused the Romans. The Romans started persecuting Christians because they were not worshipping their emperor. Moreover, the Romans were very upset about the Christians because tax was not coming to them from Christians because the Christians stopped producing myrrh. Do you understand? They stopped producing myrrh. And therefore, no tax. So that was a problem to the Roman government. And also they were not worshipping their emperor and their gods. And that was a problem. And these people began to be poor. And poor people kept increasing in that city because many people were becoming Christians. And it meant that to be a Christian is to be a poor person. And being a, a, a city of the upper middle class, they did not like people becoming poor on some religious grounds and that was the case. Now there was another problem, look, uh, another commendation that the Lord gives. He says, um, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Why? The Jews could remain Jews and be Christians. My dear friends, we must understand that in the world, Jews are the only people who could remain Jews and have the Judaic faith on top of having their Christian faith. Let me explain. Today, there are so many Messianic Jews. Who are they? They have the Tanakh, our Old Testament, as their scripture. The Tanakh has Torah, Nebi, and Ketubim, right? The, the, the 39 books of our Bible. And they they have their Shabbat on Saturday, 
they can have their seven feasts uh, and the eighth Hanukkah feast also and they can have the menorah they can they can do everything uh, as Jews because today the Jews no longer have here the the animal sacrifices and the temple they can remain Jews and they can have the New Testament the Messianic Jews believe in the Lord Jesus as their Messiah okay and uh, they they use the New Testament also and some Jews would want to call themselves Christians some would call themselves Messianic Jews both are okay now only the Jews can do that the others will have to quit being what they are to become Christians now I was a Hindu I couldn't remain a Hindu and a Christian. I had to give Hinduism, Hinduism up to become a Christian. So anybody should give up what they believe to become a Christian. But the Jews can believe in Jesus on top of what they already believe as uh, Jews. And uh, that is why even Jesus, when he was on earth, he went to the temple just like other Jews and when he went to the temple he saw that it, they were using uh, the temple as a marketplace and he was very perturbed about that he started cleansing the temple and uh, he never said okay now we are no longer Jews or Greeks we are all Christians he didn't say that he remained a Jew and uh, he also went to synagogues right remember in Nazareth he he as usual got up to read and then uh, when we uh, look um, into the lives of the apostles even after the church began Peter and John were on their way to the temple when they saw that uh, sick man uh, to who Peter says silver and gold have I none but in the name of Jesus rise up and walk so uh, they, they could remain Jews and they could uh, be Christians now the Jews of uh, uh, Smyrna were very compromising because they called themselves Jews but they bowed their heads to that emperor's statue and they also were involved in selling myrrh which was used to the worship of other deities they were already compromising and as Jews they did not maintain their pure Jew, Jewish faith they called themselves Jews and when Christianity came they thought Christianity was anti-Jewish they thought the Christian religion was uh, against what they believed but wait a minute excuse me you have allowed emperor worship into your system and you are producing myrrh to sell to those who are going to worship idols but when you look at Christians, you are you're saying they are the ones who are distorting the Jewish faith. Come on, that's hypocrisy. And that is why Jesus is saying they are the synagogue of Satan. Okay? So that's the commendation that Jesus gives. I know your tribulation, I know your poverty, yet you are rich. And I know the Jews who live among you who are not really Jews but a synagogue of Satan. Now my dear friends, this is one of the two churches, the other being Philadelphia, that does not receive a word of condemnation. In that column, condemnation, you would just put a hyphen, a dash, no condemnation. He is not condemning the church in Smyrna. Why? Is it because the Smyrna church was the most perfect church? Nope. Is it because uh, the Samana church was flawless and they were all word uh, abiding Christians? No, they had their flaws, they had their weaknesses and yet the Lord uh, gives an allowance because of their persecution. They are going through a lot. They are being persecuted, log, stock and barrel. Everybody is persecuting them, their own friends, family, the Jews, the Romans, the fellow citizens of Smyrna and uh, they are being attacked, killed, persecuted and 
amidst such persecution, they are trying their level best to live their Christian life. And Jesus is not interested in picking them for their little, little mistakes. But he ignores them. He is not condemning them. And uh, even today, my dear friends, there are so many countries in, in the world that are persecuting Christians. Christians are dying like nothing at the hands of many persecutors. And uh, if you are persecuted in your own little way by your family, by your friends, by, your, by the people who you work with and uh, by the people who you study in your schools with, uh, you know, it, however little and big your persecution is, don't think that it is something that is not good, it's good. Because on the one hand, the Lord's presence is there with you in an immense manner because of your persecution. And the Lord says, I know your persecution, I know your troubles, I know your poverty, because all these things are happening to you because of me. But also the Lord says, I'm not going to pick you for all the little, little mistakes that you are committing because you have enough on your plate. Are you with me? The persecuted church has enough on its plate and the Lord is not interested in picking and pointing at the weaknesses they have. What a glorious uh, Lord we have, don't we? Now, I uh, would like to say how during the persecution, the people in Smyrna uh, conducted their church services. Now, did this, what I'm going to say to you did not happen only in Smyrna, okay? It also happened in other parts where Christians were persecuted. But uh, largely at Smyrna, uh, when uh, they had to go for church, they didn't know where to go for worship because they didn't have a public place of worship and they would gather in the homes of believers. What would they do? What they do is to maintain uh, uh, the anonymity uh, of the venue of the church uh, service. On Saturday evening, they would pour, they would draw the sign of fish on the door of uh, the church, uh, the house where the church service was going to be held the following day. And uh, on Saturday, the Christians would have to go past, they know the believers, right? The other believers. So they would go past all these houses. And if they see the sign of the fish on one of the doors, then they'll know, uh, okay, our service tomorrow is going to be held in this home. And uh, they will have uh, worship there. And uh, the pastor of the church would tell them, okay, let's come next Sunday. Uh, for service at a location decided by us next Saturday. And the leadership would decide where to have the church service the following Sunday. And on Saturday, they would draw the uh, fish sign on the door. Now, wh why, why the fish? In Greek, fish is called ichthus, spelt iota, chi, theta, upsilon, and sigma. And the Christians used these letters to, co to construe words. Iota uh, for Jesus, meaning Jesus. Okay. Chi, which will look like an X, is to denote Christos, meaning uh, Christ. And theta, theos, theos, theu in the grammatical context meaning uh, the Lord or the God, God or gods, okay, God apostrophe S, okay. Upsilon, U, to, for huios, meaning sun, and sigma, the S, for soter, meaning savior, okay. Iota, chi, theta, upsilon, and sigma, would give the sentence, Jesus Christos Theu Huyu Soter. Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. And that fish sign, the Ictus, became the sign of Christians. Until 
313 AD but we will talk about that in our next segment when we talk about the church in Pergamum. And if you want to jump to your last column of the historical dates, my dear friends, you may call the historical era of the Smyrna church period to be from AD 100 to AD 312. From AD 100 to AD 312. Are you with me? Because that was the time when, even before that, of, co of course, from the time the church started, uh, Christians were killed. We remember how James was beheaded in the book of Acts and we remember how Stephen was uh, stoned to death, death as the first martyr and uh, those are all recorded in the book of Acts and even after that we know that every disciple of Jesus was killed. Okay, Many people died and uh, up until 312 AD uh, the church went through different stages of persecution and uh, that is why that was why they used uh, the sign ichthus and the initial christian sign was the fish ichthus and that's why we could see the sign of the fish and in some some of those signs you get all the the, the five letters also the iota chi theta upsilon sigma uh, embedded uh, within and in some uh, cars and vehicles they they paste uh, the sign in the rear. Okay, and uh, now what does Jesus uh, say by way of uh, encouragement or counsel? Okay, verse 10. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Don't be afraid. Why? Because Jesus is comparing their suffering on earth to their eternal life in heaven. What they are going to enjoy eternally is incomparable to the pain that they are, they are suffering here. And that's why he introduces himself saying, the first and the last, and who died and rose again. I was dead and alive, but my death and coming back to life involved my earthly life, which was minute in comparison to my eternal life. On the same token, you Smyrna Christians, fear not. Fear not, because what you are suffering on this earth is temporal compared to the eternal life I have. He goes on to say, behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. The persecution is not going to end. Some of you are going to suffer in prison that ye may be tried and ye shall have tribulation 10 days. Now the, the expression 10 is translated by many uh, Christians in uh, many ways. Many scholars translate in many ways and uh, uh, here it's like uh, only a short while, 10 days. You don't need to take the, the, the letter 10 and uh, build a theory on it. No, 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 no. He's just saying it was a figure of speech those days. It was a figure of speech and the people in Smyrna understood. Okay, you'll have tribulation 10 days, men. After that, you have your eternal life to live with God. So it was to show the uh, short period of time that they are going to suffer. Be thou faithful unto death. Be thou faith, faithful unto death. And I will give thee a crown of life. Stephanos. Well, you know what? Jesus is saying, it doesn't matter if they kill you. Many people have died before you. Many people have died before you. And if they kill you, they can just kill your body, that's it. <laughs> and they cannot kill your soul. They cannot destroy your spirit. You're going to live with, with me eternally. That's what he says. And in that counsel, he's uh, embedding a great word of encouragement. On the same token, I would like, want to tell you, my dear friends, what you go through on this earth is merely suffering, which is on a temporal basis. What you suffer here is completely incomparable to what you are going to enjoy in your eternal life. And verse 11 says, He that hath, hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh. This is to everybody, to you and I too. Not only to the people in Smyrna. He that overcometh shall not be hurt 
of the second death. We will be talking about the second death in detail when we talk about the second death in Revelation chapter 20, chapters 19 and 20. Okay, but for now know that it, it talks about hell. We are not hell bound. We are heaven bound. And therefore, whatever we suffer on this earth is merely temporal. Right? It doesn't matter if we lose everything, we will not suffer hell. We will go to heaven. Anyway, my dear friends, uh, this comes, brings, to, brings us to the end of the talk about the Smyrna Church. And I believe if you are going through uh, tribulations and sufferings, uh, I, I would encourage you that, you know, hang in there. The Lord is with you. And if you are to come to the ministry, don't worry. Even if you lose everything to come into the ministry, God says, I know your poverty, yet you are rich. You chose to come into ministry because of me. I will bless you. I'm like that, my dear friends. I lost a lot to come into the ministry, but I have gained a lot spiritually. I'm going to be in heaven. So my dear friends, be encouraged. Be blessed and I will see you in the next segment when we talk about the church in Pergamos. God bless you.